This episode is brought to you by Hub24, whose purpose is to connect advisors to innovative solutions that create opportunity. They're massive supporters of advisors, in particular those going solo, uh, and they're one of the early players in the managed account space, and, and their epic functionality in that area, as well as their commitment to user experience, has led them to become a market leader in terms of advisor satisfaction. I can speak from personal experience when I say their BDM team are total legends and they're there to help you work through the best solutions for your business. So you can check out more information at hub24.com.au. This episode is also brought to you by Centuria, who are a boutique ultra high performing fund manager. They've won pretty much all the awards there are to win. Uh, They've got a bunch of five star rated funds and they're heavy into technical support for advisors around their products and strategies. On top of that, they're just an awesome group of people and they've got a dedicated team there to support you. And if you haven't already spoken to the guys at Centuria and heard about what they do, do yourself a favor and reach out. We're here today with Daniel Murray from Empathic. Empathic. Empathic, Empathic. Consulting. And consulting. So, Daniel, you've come to us through a bit of a, a network of friends, you might say. There's been you've been involved with some cool stuff that's put you in touch with uh, Ray Jaramus, and and he thought it'd be awesome for everyone to hear what you're up to and what you've been doing. Yeah, yeah, but, I've got a bit of a, a, un, a different background uh, to some people. So um, I've come into contact with uh, Ray. I'm, I'm fascinated by um, advice and financial advice in particular, and, and the whole world of how do we help people create better futures for themselves mm-hmm. and uh, for each other. So there's, uh, it was a good conversation with Ray, and, yeah, he thought it would be good to get in touch and jump on the podcast. Yeah, well, the stuff that Ray's doing is really interesting. Like, he's, he's essentially studying psychology and, and um, really doing his best. He's in the academia world with mm-hmm. um, some of the researchers there, trying to link some of the psychology stuff that's going on with financial advice and yep. client engagement. So, yeah, there's lots of frontiers there and interesting things. And, and you've been – I guess you've been doing some of that stuff in the corporate or the commercial sphere for a while now. Yeah, so I guess my journey, I quite strangely, my undergrad was in pure and applied mathematics, which mm-hmm. is uh, incredibly dull. Um, and I spent most of my career uh, in banking finance, um, working for, for big companies like QBE, uh, CBA. And my role there was largely as a problem solver. So okay. I worked in internal management consulting. Um, I would get given very big problems, and my job was to fix them. So okay. as an example, I was sent to uh, uh, New Zealand. Um, Combank owned a bank over there called ASB, and my job was to help them find $130 million of cost savings. That was the brief. And, and uh, uh, how, where do you find those? <laughs> <laughs> where do you find it? Yes, right. Um, well, interestingly enough, what we did was uh, empowered the business to find them. Um, you thought, oh, we can't find the savings, we'll just increase the growth? or is that <laughs> <laughs> No, that was that was one of the things. Look, and, and psychology played a really big role there and in all projects that we do. Um, and what I found was... Uh, technical solutions are interesting, but unless you consider the human element of them, they often fail really poorly. So it was really about understanding the people, mm. um, what was going on in their heads. With a math background, you can design really amazing um, equations. So you can write a an equation which will uh, put uh, a rocket ship on the moon. And that equation, you can write it on a piece of paper and it'll work almost every time, right? Yeah. Um, you can write equations to find out where electrons are around a, an atom. Uh, they're incredibly complex, but they're equations and they work. You send a guy to the shops and ask him to get salad dressing, there is no equation you can write which is going to describe what, what he comes back with, right? No. Is it French? Is it Italian? Is <laughs> <It's>, that- <laughs> you know, or you, uh, someone walks into a shoe store to buy a pair of shoes and it's a bit of a mystery as to what they're going to come out with. Yeah, the human element is always the uh, X factor, you might say. Uh, well, absolutely. And um, you can't write clear equations uh, because we're too complicated. And uh, that complexity is something that fascinated me. Um, 
understanding it and trying to deal with it more, um, particularly things like emotions. Um, so I, I'd spent I spent quite a bit of time in uh, researching things like neuroscience and psychology and behavioural economics and reading and digesting and speaking to people. And, and my my job is how do I take my understanding of those areas and translate them into simple tools and models and frameworks that mm. business people could pick up and and start to use and practice and get better at. Yeah, nice. So is it I guess you've what what's been the thing that jumps out most of the time when you when you dropped into a business and is it anything in particular that jump, comes comes to the fore? Yeah, I, I think the um, one thing that never sort of goes away or you see really regularly and yet um, is completely false is that we have this underlying belief that we're rational. Mm. You know, the e- economics has this this theory of the rational investor uh, who always maximises their utility. Mm-hmm. When it comes to human humans, that is complete rubbish. Like, it's just not at all true. Um, and the example I always use for this is um, if humans were rational, how many types of car would there be on the road? Well, it'd just be one, and it'd, it'd be, be the one. cheapest colour. Yeah, yeah. And, and like <laughs> there might be a couple of sizes, like maybe small, medium, large, but there would be very, very few. Yeah, it'd be the small car, the medium, and the family size. Yeah. And funnily enough, when you you read back about it, that was Henry Ford's vision, right? Mm. He he fought with his own family and his company because they wanted to make new, different types of car, and he said, "We don't need more. We've got it. We've got one, and it works." I stop asking questions. Yeah. Um, and what never ceases to amaze me is that while we know that we don't buy cars because of what they are, we buy cars because of how they make us feel. Mm. We know this, right? Mm. It's obvious when you think about it. While we know that we're not rational, we just continue to build systems and processes and f- whole mm. organisations and structures around this misinterpretation mm. of humans. Completely ignoring the human element. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and whether it, it's in uh, advice and banking or uh, construction, um, we, you know, if we got a computer to design a building, all the buildings in Sydney would be identical mm. and they'd be really efficient and really effective, low energy use. That would be, you could do that tomorrow. No one would want to live there. No one mm. would want to work there because it wouldn't inspire us. There's no character that comes into play. Uh, and it doesn't It doesn't deal with the most important things of humans, which is emotions. Mm. And so um, emotions are what drive us. Um, your phone doesn't have emotions. It, you know, your phone actually doesn't even have problems. I think Siri gets upset sometimes, <laughs> depending on what you ask her. She's been told to respond in certain ways. Ah, based on but she's formulas. not feeling it. She's not feeling it. <laughs> uh, you, you don't... Um, you know, the example I always think about here is um, what would happen if I asked a computer to draw a dragon? Well, a simple computer program would go and find a million pictures of dragons and then show you all of these pictures of dragons, right? Yeah. And then found them and you've, you're done. You've solved your problem. If you ask a little kid to do it, what do they do? Probably just think of the last dragon they saw and just draw it. And they draw, well, they imagine it, right? Yeah, well, they imagine it, yeah. Right? They can draw things that, they've, that have never existed before. Mm. And, and that's miraculous. That's incredible. Uh, humans, are, uh, the genius of humans is that we can feel things and, and believe in things that aren't real, mm. that don't exist. Um, and, and this area of, you know, psychology and the way the brain works when you look at neuroscience, we, the belief we have about how our brains work and how they actually work mm. are really distant. And we build all of our, we build a lot of businesses, we build a lot of infrastructure for these mythical, rational humans mm-hmm. that don't exist. Would you would you say there's, um, I guess, what you're coming up against is a rigid, rigidity, rigidity of thought um, that gets applied to things? And is is your role when you come in to add a bit of flex into things so it adapts to like these emotions and yeah. the, is that uh, look? I, I'm not sure if it's. Um, the rigidity is inbuilt, right? So you've got to remember your brain isn't – it's been designed or developed or evolved over a really, really long period of time, mm-hmm. right? So your brain's been on a journey for millions of years to get to where it is now, and it's incredibly complicated, complex and beautiful, and, and, you know, it's about 85 billion 
uh, neurons connected through trillions of little pathways and how electrical currents fire through those pathways is what makes up everything that you know, right? Does that equate to Watson yet? Or? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think Watson is anywhere near that complicated. Okay. Right? It's just we, we can't so make... So we've still, we still got one up on AI at the moment? Mm, sort of. So <laughs> <laughs> the, the challenge, though, with our brains is um, it was designed... So for most of those, let's say, 3 million years, most of those 3 million years... Your brain was evolved to live in a certain environment. And specifically, the, the most complicated thing we, we ever have to deal with is other human beings, right? Mm. We're way more complicated than the rest of the environment. So our brain has been designed to live in environments of about 100 to 200 people mm. who are just like us. Yeah, right? okay. 200 years ago, you lived in a village in uh, Finland, for example. Mongolian people didn't exist. They were irrelevant. Actually, for most people in those small villages, Italians didn't exist. Yeah. Right? They, they just never came. Genghis Khan had not made it yet. <laughs> well, the, the challenge is even if those events happened, they were rare. Yeah. Short windows of time. Alexander the Great. Yeah, and, and they would come, but then they would go. And, and the majority of a life, or your, the way our brain was hardwired, the majority of the people we interacted with were pretty much like us. Mm. And so we sort of created this base understanding of how people are. Mm-hmm. that they're all pretty much like us, right? Now, that hardware hasn't changed in the last 50, 100 years, but, gee, the environment has, mm. right? Now we walk down the street and we'll interact with uh, thousands of people who are nothing like us, who think totally differently, who look mm. totally differently. And so while the rigidity is apparent now because of these differences in us, mm. it shouldn't be surprising, because the, the hardware we're dealing with hasn't upgraded or hasn't changed. And the what I call mental models that we build, these are the I sort of think of them as ways in which we understand how the world is. Mm. Uh, and I describe this as a huge filing cabinet in your head with thousands of little cue cards, right? Mm. So as a baby, it's empty. Mm-hmm. Then you start to interact with the world and you start to fill out these cue cards. You know, a chair. Or your little experiences. Yeah, exactly right. Experiences. Mm. So, you know, touching something that's hot, that hurts, and I don't do that. And, you know, eating food's good and tastes nice. And, you know, I get these feedback and response and certain foods I like and some I don't. All these different uh, relationships, interactions happen, mm-hmm. and we store them in these little cards. And, and these are really important. So when you walk into a room and you see the chairs, you know their chairs straight away, right? It's instant. Yeah, chairs. It's assumed. Yeah. And if there's chairs and there's tables and uh, it's on an outside area, it's probably a restaurant or a cafe. Now, there's nothing that says this is a restaurant or a cafe, but you know it instantly because it matches to a model you've built in your head that says restaurants and cafes are often outside with tables and chairs, Mm -hmm. right? So these shortcuts are really important. We build them so that we can navigate through the world quickly and efficiently and effectively. Mm -hmm. Um, The problem is we use them for other people. Mm. And when we find people who we don't know very well or aren't like us, Mm -hmm. the amount of information we have on that little card for them is fairly limited, Mm. right? So it's natural that we'll go, mum and dad are complex and, you know, have many layers because I know lots about them. And me, myself, I'm a complicated person and I'm I'm very interesting and complicated and I've got all these things. North Korean people, the amount of information you've got on that card will be really small. Mm. And it's, um, what's the what's the show the the cartoon with the Americans um. American Dad or yeah, <laughs> yeah you know so we, when we don't have a very detailed mental model we we have an assumption the trick we've got is that the way we navigate through the world naturally we believe that our mental models are objective truths mm. right so and you're projecting that you pro- well, you you use that as your mm. basis for everything that you do and think and the story you tell yourself so. Uh, a lot of what I'm trying to do with businesses is not necessarily um, change them mm. or change the systems. What I'm trying to do is let the people and the leaders in the business be aware of what's going on inside their own heads. And what we're trying to do is help push them towards being more curious leaders who look at those areas that they don't understand and instead of going, well, you know, I don't know and so I'm going to ignore it, go, well, that's interesting. I hmm, wonder what else could be going on there. So retraining, I guess, the immediate behaviour that people react with things they don't know? Is that sort yeah, of... Yeah, that's right. And and 
the most important one is how do I react with other people, my customers or um, my employees, my peers, my boss. Mm. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example. I was, I was speaking at a, um, a conference uh, for a client two weeks ago. And we do an exercise, and in this exercise, they have to um, in pairs have a share a conversation. And then I asked everyone to put their hand up and you know share their their story. And as is often the case, uh, immediately no one puts their hand up. Right, no one wants to go first. Cool. Um, and then after a few seconds, as a facilitator, I've always learned that um, silence is more uncomfortable for them than it is for me. Mm-hmm. So just let everyone hang there and then someone will put their hand Should up. Should I say something? <laughs> someone will say something, right? So I, I waited uh, and a guy put his hand up and he said, oh, Garth's got a great story. Pointed <laughs> to the guy next to him, right? And I won't go into that story, but let's just take that particular incident that occurred. Stubbed him in. Stubbed him in. Okay, cool. So <laughs> what's happening here is you've got a model as to the guy's name was Alan. Why Alan did what he did? What's your? What do you think he? Why do you think he did it? Well, he didn't have a good idea, but he knew um, Bob had a good idea, so he thought, share Bob's idea. Sure. Okay. So, <laughs> so he he might have thought that that's one possible scenario. Now, or he just like he just wanted to give shit to Bob, so he's like, ah, hey, right. Man. So that could be true as well. He might have looked at me and felt. Ah, oh, this guy's feeling really uncomfortable because no one's saying anything. Mm. I feel really bad about that. I want to break the silence, and I know Bob's got a good story, mm. so I'll dob in Bob. So there's a whole bunch of possible reasons why he might have been. Maybe he's an asshole, right? Maybe Alan's just not a very good guy, and he doesn't like Bob, and he knows Bob's going to feel uncomfortable if he dobs him in. He's going to do it anyway because that's just how he is. Now, what's interesting is. At the moment, we don't know if any of those stories are real, but what you'll generally do is you'll choose one straight away. Mm. The, the, you'll the pick your favourite story. The instinctive one. Yeah. The story that fits the model of the person. That could be based on what he looks like. Mm. It could be based on how you feel at that point in time. A whole bunch of situational information. Mm. But you choose one and you choose it instantly. And then you proceed based on that basis. And you react to everything like that. So if, if mm. I believe that uh, he's a great guy who's helping me out, I'll be kind to him and nice to him, more, more likely to be. Mm-hmm. If I believe he's being an ass, then I'll treat him in, in that regard. right? And so straight away at that point in the, the conference, we're going to have a junction where there's two really different paths that we could go down, which could influence everything else that's going to happen. And everyone in everyone the course in the, is making a call. Absolutely, right. Yeah. And yet... Those that decision is not based on anything factual. It's based on that mental model I choose. It's the shortcuts. That's right. Yeah. And so what, what we're trying to do is say to leaders, be aware that that's going to happen. It, it, it happens all the time. You do it all the time, right? Irrespective of whether you're conscious of it or not, you do it all the time. Be aware of it. Mm-hmm. When you find incidents where the result of that reaction could be important, as in that situation – then you need to be uh, consciously able to pause and be curious and go, okay, well, hang on, what else could be true here? Reframe it. What else might be going on? And look at possibilities. And then how do I determine which one's going to be right? Well, I'll need more information. And so you might not pass judgment on Alan straight away, but you Mm. might go, oh, that's interesting, Alan. Why did you think Bob's story is a good story? Mm. You can can start to explore that and break that down. Um, And so... In each of these tiny little situations that we go through in life, we don't realise it, but we run on automatic mm. all the time using these existing models, mm-hmm. and we do it because we believe they are objective truths about the world, right? We believe that they they are how they are. People are how they are. Things are how they are. What about if it's – is it just easier for some people to operate like that? It's absolutely easy. No, we, now we, we don't do it because we're bad people. Yeah. This is important, right? You're not doing it that way because you're not a good person or you're dumb or insensitive. You're doing it because your brain is designed not for brilliance. Your brain is designed for survival. Mm-hmm. And having that thought process of being curious slows you right down. Mm-hmm. Now, in a survival situation, that is not what you want to do. <laughs> you don't mm. want to slow right down, right? You want to react. Your body's designed to stay alive. Your brain is designed help you do that so your natural reaction is do it quickly make a decision and then move forward mm-hmm. right maybe there was a um, 
in our ancestry. Maybe there was a branch of, of humans that, that branched off and they didn't have that sort of natural hardwired mm. mental model survival instinct. They were just always curious. Yeah. They didn't make it, right? Because when the lions started coming around and they're like, oh, these things look interesting. Wonder Maybe they're not angry today. They were just swept out of the gym. They would have been fine if they <laughs> were born in the Renaissance. That's but right. <laughs> at that That's point right. in time. Well, well and even, <laughs> even that, right? So through history, you can, you can look at history really easily, uh, really quickly and see a huge number of people who were curious and challenged norms and what happened to them. Mm. You know, Galileo was put Wasn't received too well. Wasn't received well at all because <laughs> the brain is, your brain's designed to remove uncertainty from the world, mm. right? That's what it's designed to do. Questioning things does not reduce uncertainty. It adds uncertainty. Mm. Right? And, and that's what I'm challenging you to do. Open your uh, possibilities up. You're not designed to do it. I'm curious, have you seen correlations between whether it's certain roles, backgrounds, um, char- characteristics of people mm-hmm. and their ability to sort of not get caught up in, is it an experience thing? Is it is it someone that's come from a certain background or someone that has certain life experiences that generally dictates that or what? what? Yeah, look, it's um, I, I liken it to... Uh, being athletic, right? So, um, because people often say, so I would call this area um, as the skill of empathy. Mm-hmm. Um, people often say, well, empathy, you're either born with it or you're not. It's natural. It's not teachable, right? It's just this innate thing. And I sort of go, yeah, I don't agree. Uh, I think that's rubbish because there are people who are naturally born better at running than others. Mm-hmm. But if they don't use it in practice, then you know, sitting on the couch, you're not very, you're not going to be very mm. good at running. There are people who aren't born very talented, that's very talented runners who mm. do ultra marathons and are fantastic at yeah. it. Um, it I, I think empathy is much the same, right? You might have a predisposition to a certain uh, style, mm-hmm. um, but it's something you can learn, you can practice, and if you don't practice it, you will lose it. Um, and it, you question are there people who are more um, predisposed to being good at this stuff, yes, but I would say it's less natural and more because they they practice behaviours that help them do it. Yeah, um, would it be life um, activity in their life that tipped them into discovering more about that or sometimes. force them to? Yeah, look, I think sometimes. I mean, often I find people who travel a lot, mm-hmm. um, they will. St- not always, but there's a good correlation, I think, between travelling and being more curious because you're immediately mm. challenged with all of your mental models, right? Mm. Because they don't hold anymore. Yeah. Um, well, the question on that one is, but are the people that go travelling, are they already – they're already in that bucket. They're, ah, they're predipo- predisposed to it. Um, potentially. It's, it, and they just – and they compound it because they're training it more. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, do – do people travel to see, you know, some people go to Thailand so they can go to a resort and lay by the pool. Mm. I think that's madness. You can do that here. Why Why go all the way over there when you can go and explore a new culture? So there's, mm. you know, th- there are different motivations and re- re- why, why, reasons why people travel and ways in which they do it. Um, well, we've got, like at XY Advisor, we've got a strong affinity with South America and mm. uh we had we had a session with uh, Emily, who who is our um, community manager, and pretty much just talking about that's why she got hired because she uh, she travelled to South America, mm. and um, and like just that attitude was it was in sync with how we operate. Yeah, and look, I, I think I, I personally love travelling. I love exploring, and I I find it a really great way to um, to practice. You know that that level mm. of understanding. Um, but look, here's a, an, ex- or an example or an exercise in ways that uh, you can get unstuck if you don't do it. Even if you travel regularly, but let's just say um, you're getting on a train. Mm-hmm. Now, here in Sydney, you get on a train, not really, you don't line up, but you sort of get on after the person who's in front of you, right? Mm-hmm. Now, let's say you're there on the station, you're getting on, and you notice a person uh, who looks like they might be from India, for example, and they'll walk up to the side of the train, they'll scoot along the edge of the train, and then they'll just sort of you know, push on in front of someone. Yeah, you know, yeah. just sort of cut the line a little bit. They've, they've, they've had a different background of getting on trains. Yeah, that's a right. A more now, you, you competitive... Were, uh, that's right. Now, <laughs> now, it's easy for you if, if you haven't seen or, or witnessed this before. If it's you, a horrible person. He's cutting in. Yeah, how dare he? He's yeah. rude, right? 
And mm. in your little mental model, you, know, you don't know much about people from India, right? So you have this little mental model. It's pretty blank. And you'll put that in there. Oh, that's mm. strange. Rude at getting on trains. And you might see that happen a couple of times and that will reinforce your belief. And mm. you might even turn that belief into, I think Indian people might be just rude. Yeah. Right? And now it's not to say you're a bad person. I think you're misinformed, but it doesn't mean you're a bad person. That's just how our brain builds mm. these mental models, right? The problem is if you try to get on a train in Mumbai the way you do here in Sydney, you yeah, die on, on the station. <laughs> no, you never leave the platform yep. no, because the, the whole context is completely different. And they're thinking you're stupid. That's right. <laughs> well, maybe they're not even thinking. They're just on autopilot. This is just how you get on a train, isn't it? That right? guy didn't get on the train again. He's yeah. <laughs> like, oh, why, why are they standing back waiting over there when you just get on the train like this? Yeah. Um, and in context, uh, you know, the, the environment, the framing, all of those things play a huge role. Mm. And go back to the, the um, salad dressing thing, right? There is a million little factors at play. And, um, you know, if my wife sends me to get salad dressing and I come back with the wrong one, she's like, how could you get that wrong? I'm like, well, but the, it's so easy to get it right. How couldn't I have got it wrong? There's so many options. And she's mm. like, but there's only, you know, for her it's really clear and obvious. Mm. For me it's incredibly complex. Why would you get the one with lots of sugar in it? Like yeah, that? exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> totally. So, but objectively, is getting, a, is getting a salad dressing either really simple or really complex? Well, objectively, it's neither. Mm. Right? It, it's very contextual. It's just when you've got two humans involved, yep. it can become quite complex. And, and so <laughs> where, where does that travel to business? Well, you know, you, you sit down, uh, and I'd love to do this experiment if there's any, any advisors who want to do this with me. One of the experiments we want to do is um, get advisors and their customers to sit down and have a conversation. Mm. Record the conversation, get it transcribed, and, and at some point in the future, share a bunch of phrases that were spoken on that in that in, uh, meeting with the client and just ask them to cross out any of the terms or uh, phrases or, or any of the um, acronyms that they didn't understand. Just, yep. just cross them out. And then present what's left back to the advisor and go, you know, you had the conversation. In your mind, they understood it, right? Yeah. Felt like they understood it all. Yeah. And you understood it all, so you assume they did. Yeah. But here's actually what landed. I don't have high hopes for that sometimes, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> no, but this is the important mm. – this is critical, right? Because what lands for the client is the basis by which they say yes or no, mm. the basis by which they trust you, the relationship, everything that goes forward from that moment. Well, it's is generally a, an emotive decision. Absolutely, right? And um, Unless for – like there's a certain subset where there was a really rational way that things were decided upon. Yep. But the majority – the majority of this, and, and, the, and all they remember is the emotive thoughts absolutely. that they made. And, and this is a really, um, that's a really important point uh, for everyone to remember. We don't remember everything that happens. Our, mm. our memories don't work like videotape, right? Or I don't know, videotape doesn't exist anymore. But yeah, <laughs> anyway, it's not like photographs. It's it's, it's not like a series of photographs um, or or video at all. The way we remember things is by prioritizing specific uh, moments. Mm. And the way we prioritize is based on whether something had an emotion attached to it. Mm-hmm. All right, so I'll give you an example. People often say uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman, the, the great Nobel Prize winning psychologist, he's studied this extensively. I highly recommend looking up his work in this space. Um, if you go to Disneyland, Majority of people say it was magical. It was amazing. What an amazing day we had at Disneyland, yeah? Cool. I agree. If you took a minute-by-minute minute play of their day, the majority of their day was standing in really long lines, paying way too much for terrible food, you know, hearing people scream, trying to organise the kids and, you know, yep. spending way more money than you hope to. There was that one moment. Objectively, your day wasn't a great day. Yeah. Right? You could easily look at all the information and go, that wasn't a very good day. Yeah. But the emotions that you felt around you, you know, your kids saw Donald Duck or you know, all these different activities, th- these emotions, these peaks, I mean, your brain, it's almost like a highlighter for your brain or memory, mm. and you highlight that and you drag all the whole day comes with that and you go Disneyland was amazing it was too complicated to say it was just that point in the day it, it, well <laughs> but it, it's even more than that your brain doesn't remember it 
in right. a videotape. It remembers moments, and any moment that has a really strong emotional peak, we way, way overemphasize. So happy child yep. in Disneyland and memory. Done. Sees the princess. Oh, my God. Yeah, this was amazing. Right? Weddings are the same. Mm. People love weddings. Most of it's sitting around eating dinner with your family. Right? The you don't love Sundays at your mum's place as much as you do at weddings. Hey, speak for yourself. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it's a different experience because there's different levels of emotion. Yep. And these emotions are what drive us and the emotions are, are all that really matter. Mm. It's, uh, it's so interesting. I, one of the things that was coming to mind when you were talking before is um, around the empathy piece is, is sort of like being conscious but not acting on it. Mm. What do you say around that space? So a lot of people will say, oh, yeah, I, I understand what's going on there. I'm just not going to change how I'm behaving. Or yeah, okay, cool. what's Because that would be another thing you come up against. Because like, cause obviously there's the awareness piece. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cool. And then there's the people that are aware that aren't actually acting on yep. that awareness. What What's yeah. going on there? Um, so... That's a really good point. I think about empathy as a two-step process. Mm-hmm. You build it, then you get to use it. Yeah. Right? And so bad salespeople, uh, and we've all experienced this, think that they try and use it before they built it, right? They mm. come up to you and go, ah, oh, Adrian, I know you, you need this this new jacket. Here's raising. It does all these things. Here's this thing you need. Oh, you definitely need this. And they just start telling you hey, what you need. And yet everyone goes, you have no idea, right? Leave me alone. You're just annoying. That's Except a good example. Well, but there's enough people that say, oh, yeah, yeah to yeah. keep them going. <laughs> well, what, what they do is they um, they have a bunch of features, and this is the old way of sell, right? Build a bunch of features, then go and tell lots and lots of people, and some people will want, want those features. So you'll yeah. be right sometimes. Yeah. Um, not a particularly effective um, strategy. It's not very 21st century. Not very 21st century, no. Um, although it's still heavily used. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so empathy is this two-step process. Now, building empathy is building an understanding of what's going on for another person, what's happening. Um, I'm going to be controversial. It is not walking in someone else's shoes per se. Because okay. walking in someone else's shoes will be your experience in their shoes. Mm. That's not their experience in their shoes. Yeah. Right, if you're, you're, your little kid's doing maths homework, okay? well, my daughter, she, well, she's just doing maths homework, she's a bit young yet, but when she does, if I say to her, well, what do you mean it's hard? It's easy. I did home, maths homework when I was a kid and it was easy, mm. so it'll be easy for you. Mm. That's not empathy. I, I have walked in her shoes. Yeah. I could sit down and do her homework now. Yeah. Right? It, it, that's not empathy. Mm. And even, like, I guess, actually, that's something that you'd see in, that's probably one of the, like, I've seen in the workplace and in the, that jump from like that non-acceptance that, well, if that's how I behave in that situation, that's right. Then why, like, you uh, should sort your shit out and just do the same thing. That's like. right, and it, 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 it's a really cool point, right? So empathy is building this understanding of another person, what's driving them, what's going on there, and there's a lot to unpack in that. The second step is how you use it is up to you. Mm. I would say, controversially, maybe I'd say Bernie Madoff was probably really empathetic. He really understood what drove people. He understood their greed. He understood exactly how to motivate them to give them unbelievable amounts of money that he stole and, and defrauded them on. How he chooses to use it is up to him, mm. right? And and this is a decision for all of us. If if um, if you're a hugely empathetic person, sociopaths are often incredibly empathetic. Mm. They know how it makes you tick, right? Mm-hmm. And they play on that constantly. Yeah. You know, there's a lots of people who talk about, uh, particularly in, in relationships where, you know, people will say things just because they know it's going to create a certain reaction. Well, mm. that's that requires me to understand mm. your experience and what's going on in your head, mm. and then I'm going to use it against you. That uh, That's a much more difficult thing to change. Mm. But what we try and do in business is we try and change those behaviours and outcomes without giving people better understandings of what's actually going on mm. with each other. So you're taking people that... Don't have that toolkit. That's right. That that first toolkit. How do we actually build mm. this understanding of what's going on? So they might have the right. Like once they once they're taught, then they yep. they'll make the best use of it. I can't fix people with bad intent, mm. and, and and that's a different thing, right? Is that like a that sort of sits in the cultural? It sits in cultural. Look, there's there's um, 
the old phrase like a few percent one percent of the population are like you know psychopaths and things like that mm. and so if you're in a room of 100 people there's one somewhere mm. <laughs> i don't know who it is but one of you know there, there's those sorts of uh, things i'm not about how do you fix those people I'm about how do you take the other 99 and help them to do the first part more effectively. Mm. Because I I think most people in business, most advisors, most people in any industry have genuinely decent intent for each Mm. other. It's the skills in which to overcome these uh, constraints our brain puts on our mental models. That's the bit we want to try and do first. Mm. Most people, they're not out to hurt and be vindictive on other people. Most of the problem happens when they don't understand that person's driver's perspectives, what's going on with them, mm-hmm. and therefore they prescribe something which totally misses the, mm. you know, misses the point. Not because they had bad intent. Yeah. Would would you? I'm, my mind's going to a space where you've got the observation of other people and how you react to their, um, I guess, activity. Mm. But what about that same sort of? So being empathetic, I'm like, what about the same sort of? Um, breadth of thought when you're thinking about yourself yeah it's a really um self-reflection is tough right yeah um the neuroscience is very clear on this the world doesn't exist other than the way you construct it in your head yeah and so often the way you see things isn't what's there it's how your brain is constructing the story that's going on right and mm-hmm. so um yeah what's the story that's going on for someone else the the critical point is being clear that that I think that's true only because of what's going on in my own head. And mm. if I want to be able to change this story, I need to be able to understand mm. why I'm doing what I'm doing. Well, like I guess the scenario I'm thinking, like maybe maybe a couple where there's been a, in a situation where there's there's friction, there's an issue, and you've been the person's been empathetic to the other partner. The other partner's now in a much better space. Yep, but they haven't actually. Sort of themselves out, mm. so they fixed that issue that's arisen, but they they haven't actually self. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a really interesting point. There's a big difference between um, I, when I go into emotions. I run workshops in this space, and we talk about emotions. It's weird, right? A guy with a math degree and an MBA who's worked in banking and finance coming mm. and talking about emotions. Yeah. Um, but they're really important. You've got to deal with them, right? We've got to be able to access this. Is this like, oh, I learned, I know how everything works. I just didn't figure this one out. i got to go figure it out. <laughs> A little, maybe, maybe. I've got the maths model of the world. I, oh, yeah, well, that goes there, everything. I guess the question These emotions is, just keep on screwing <laughs> up my models. Totally. <laughs> totally. Well, and the thing is, is there anything more important than other people, right? We all make the decisions. You know, it's human. All problems are human problems. Your iPhone never has a problem. Your computer never has a problem. Like it doesn't. What's go, our problem with this? It's your problem because mm. it's not doing the things you want it to do, right? Mm. It's still a human problem. Um, and so we need to realize this about humans. All things are human. All problems are human problems. And we need to understand what drives humans. What drives humans is emotion. Mm. I buy the car because of how it might make me feel, not because of what it is. Right. Well, how is this? How is this applied to your life? How have you? So you get you get this flag that comes up saying, "Ah, oh, this is not rational," but I'm still going to do it. Totally, that, totally, absolutely. And, you but know. you've you've got this. Would you say you've you've got this heightened awareness? Maybe as this journey's going on, and you're like, "Ah, that's pretty interesting." Yeah, I'm just like everybody else. I'm going to go. <laughs> we're you know um, the interesting thing with emotions. Financially, having a child is a really really dumb idea. Right? From an advisor's mm. perspective, you'd go, Phew, return on investment, horrible. Right? <laughs> it's a depreciating asset. Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really it's not a great thing to do. But we do it, right? You, you know, you would if you were going to advise a, a customer buying a car, you, you would go, I don't know, a Corolla maybe or a Kia. Right? Oh, Utility. Something. Yeah. Low cost. Yeah, used car. Yeah, used car. Yeah. Right? But we don't do that. <laughs> we buy, you know, I, I don't want that. Um What's interesting, and this is where humans are, are beautiful, right? This is the amazing part about us. Because if we didn't have that heightened awareness, there'd be no art. Mm. Why would someone pay millions and millions of dollars for um, some material with some colours on it? Like that, that's this ridiculous. What we do though is humans project a story onto that. Mm. That canvas, the Mona Lisa, for example, that canvas isn't a canvas. 
it's all of the shared knowledge and memory we have about that mm. and all of these amazing stories that go with it. That's what you're buying, right? Mm. You're buying all of that. Most of that exists only in our heads. Mm -hmm. It's not real. Can't touch it. I can touch the painting, mm. but that's useless. And this is the... When well, you, for example, I personally struggle with art sometimes in that, so what... What's it represent? What's it mean? Like, <laughs> what <do you> mean? <laughs> and other people go, well, what do you mean? What does it mean? Like, can't you see it? This is why we're, we're amazing. Yeah, it's, it's red. Um, red, it's well constructed. Um, <laughs> it's right. Um, there's famous <laughs> paintings. There's a bit of left brain, left brain, right brain going here. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, it's just different brains, right? Mm. We, we, we all have these different amazing brains. And it's this diversity that allows us to come up with brand new ideas. So I'll give you a simple exercise to think about the need for diverse brains. I've got a bit of a bugbear, right, because most diversity uh, in Australia, particularly in business, is really focused on gender and race. And, and don't get me wrong, we do need to improve the gender balance and we do need to get um, you know, a much better – we need to get less old white men. It's the only thing I'm going to become in my old age, unfortunately. But <laughs> we need to get less old white men and more you know, amazing different people. Mm. But you're, you're, you're about to say that – the layer below that is what's... What we need, though, is different brains who think differently. Mm. That's what business needs. Mm. So think, imagine three, we've got three brains, right? And these brains produce an output, zero to nine. Each one of them can produce any single number from zero to nine. So we've mm -hmm. got 10 possibilities, 10, 10, 1,000 possible answers can come out of these three brains. Mm -hmm. Really stable because there's only 1,000 possible answers. Each mm -hmm. one of them in themselves aren't particularly complicated mm -hmm. and therefore... If you wanted to create a team with stability and simplicity, this is a great team, mm. right? If you live in a really complicated world like we do now, volatile, uncertain, ever-changing technology, blah, 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 um, you, this is not going to cut it. So we take one of the brains out. We bring in a new brain. This brain thinks in letters. What, what happens now? Well, now instead of 10 by 10 by 10, it's 10 by 10 by 26. Mm-hmm. Okay, now we've more than doubled the number of possible outcomes, gone from 1,000 yep. to 2,600. In a second, right? It was easy. Yeah. Cool. Let's take out another brain and let's bring in one that thinks in colours. Mm. What happens now? Well, the options the explode. whole rainbow, yeah. Uh, options start to explode, right? The number. So of what happens? But when those new new brains come in? Absolutely. So when the new brains come in, two things happen. One, the the number of opportunities for us to create new stuff explodes. Now, if you have three people who've all got colour brains, you you almost get overwhelmed with too much opportunity. And mm. this is why diversity is useful, right? Because the, the zero to nine guy mm. helps constrain and, and create some stability. So this team is a much, much more effective team than the first team. Mm. The challenge is the mental models that these three brains were built from, from mm. scratch, from birth, are almost certainly going to be vastly different. When they relate to each other, they will automatically, naturally, because we're designed this way, assume that they're the same. Right? Well, if you between just, the different? It, well, of course. They'll go, well, yeah. you know, at work, this is the way we act. You know, we all wear suits and ties. And, you know, the, the, the first brain might go, we wear suits and ties. We come in at eight. We leave at five. When times get tough, we, we grit our teeth and we work longer hours. Mm. And that's how we do business, right? Mm -hmm. This is how business works. And in the old days, that was fine. That's how everyone got by. And if you didn't do it that way, mm. maybe business wasn't for you. Mm. That was the old way of thinking. Yeah. Cool. Well, that doesn't work anymore. We need this new group who look really different. And so suddenly one of the people are coming in wearing a suit and tie, the other's coming in on you know, a skateboard wearing, you know, shorts, and they're going, well, you mustn't be very professional because you're not dressing like I am. Mm. This is a good example of those clashing mental models, right? Well, it's, it's such a great um, space to talk about in respect of advisors and what's expected of them, yep. what they want to do, what their clients want. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of the listeners out there, and a lot of, I guess, X Y the guys in the X Y advisor community, mm. um, I guess, are, are constantly battling against this because they're they're thinking the way you're thinking, but they're still within a constraint of, I guess, you got the societal expectations, yeah. you've got um, what other other advisors are doing, yeah. um, you've got what clients expect, what they don't expect, and. Absolutely, and and that's where it becomes difficult because, and and, and this is my advice would be, um, what you need to be able to do is understand where that person's coming from. Mm. If they demand that you turn up in a suit and tie, mm. you could say, well, maybe that's because they're a you know, certain type of person. Mm. Maybe ask yourself a question: Well, what else might be true? What else? Why else might they be thinking that? 
and, and explore that a little bit more. Just Maybe give me an idea, like a little questionnaire before the meeting. What would you like me to wear? Yeah. Well, maybe um, <laughs> now I'll, I would think they would probably go. Well, you know what I want you to wear, right? Because I expect you to already know that. And and this is where I see you do a, like a bit of a closet question where it's like, oh, well, um, if you saw someone like this, what would you expect them to wear? Well, here's an issue. How do you know what to wear? How do you choose? Because like, you got to choose, right? You go into a meeting, you got to choose what to wear. How do you choose? Yeah. Well, I had a, I had a regression from ties. Because mm-hmm. we're meant to wear tyres all the time, yep. and like I don't find them very comfortable, and um, and I took them off, and the, like the client still reacted the same. Cool, okay, no tyres, and then um, and then some people I've had. Oh, I actually had a chat with someone the other the other week. So like we could, you happy for what would you think about shorts and thongs? And he's like, that'd be awesome. I'm like, oh, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> then you got that whole weight of the expectations sitting there going, oh, I, I do like the idea of that. Yeah. But so here's what's funny, right? When people say, oh, that society has expectations, point to me where society is. Mm. And where, where are these expectations written now? They're in your head, right? Mm. You're exactly right. They're only in your head. It's the only place they exist. All right, sure, some things it is. It could be. <laughs> now, the question would be, does that work for your clients? Does that meet their needs? Does, do they still trust you? Is it, you know, a lot of these things become well, really that, important. Yeah, well, the question is, does it work for their subconscious? That's right. And, because, and does mm. it impact on the way that they're going to interact with you? Exactly. These are where things become important. And, you know, you, you want to have, you want advisors want to be peeling that little that back a little bit and thinking about these interactions. Mm. Um Advice in particular, I I built a little story. It's like a kid's story for my daughter. She's only seven months old, so she's a bit, she's a bit young. But uh, the book's not ready yet, so it hasn't gone to publish. But um, the story's a really simple one. Um, it's about a, a monkey and a rhino. They live around this big tree, right? And um, the, the monkey climbs the very top of the tree, picks the, the young new leaves, which is the rhino's favourite, and takes it to the rhino. And, and the rhino, he fends off the lions when they come around trying to get to the monkey. And they've got a good partnership going on, right? And so one day there's this huge storm. Storm rolls in, down comes the rain, and then it hails. Big wads of hail are slamming down, and, and after the storm has passed, the monkey's lying there, and he's battered and bruised, and he turns to the rhino and says, Rhino, are you okay after that storm? And the rhino's like, yeah, I'm fine. Monkey said, but the, the hail, like it battered me, is really hard. Um, how come you're okay? And Ryan's like, well, I'm big and tough. I've got thick skin. Monkey says, well, what, what have I got to do? And Ryan says, you've got to toughen up. You've just got to get thick skin like me. Anyway, so the monkey thinks about it. He goes away and he finds some clay and mud. And he puts it on his arms and his legs and his chest and bakes himself in the sun. He's like, cool, I'm going to be sweet now, right? And he can't climb to the top of the tree anymore, which is a bit annoying for the rhino. But, you know, he's, his friend's going to be okay. Anyway, the next storm rolls in. Rain comes down, washes off the clay and the mud. Down comes the hail and the same thing happens. The monkey's laying there again, battered and bruised. And he says to the rhino, oh, what have I got to do? The runner's like, it's easy. You just got to toughen up and get thick skin like me. So he's a bit annoyed and he, he dejected. He, he lays back against the tree. And as he does, this little squirrel pops his head out of a hole in the tree. And the monkey says to the squirrel, are you okay after that storm? And the squirrel says, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm fine. Thank you. And the monkey says, but do you have thick skin? It doesn't look like you've got thick skin. And the squirrel says, oh, no, 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 Mr. Monkey. We can't all have thick skin. It doesn't work that way. You've got to look at yourself and what capabilities you've got to survive. For me, I'm little, so I can hide in this hole in the tree, which is only really small. Mm. You've got to look around for ways that you might be able to survive. So the monkey thinks about it. He goes and he, you know, he sees this ant living under a rock, but he can't live under the rock, right? And he, he sees the fish are fine in the in the little pond, but he can't hold his breath underwater. And he finds this hole, and there's a badger living in there, and the badger doesn't want to share, so he can't stay with him. But he thinks about it a bit more, and as the next storm rolls in, he walks over, and he sits underneath the belly of the rhino, and lets the hail hit the rhino, and he's safe. And the, the problem we have sometimes with advice is that we only see it from our own mental models. Mm. We only see it from our own frame of reference because we are trapped in our own tra- frames of reference. Mm. We live with them all day. The whole world that we think is real is what we construct in our head, seen through our eyes and lived mm. through our experience. So naturally when we give advice, that's the place we give it from. Mm-hmm. Not because we're bad people. <laughs> 
just because that's how we're designed. Yeah. And yet as soon as we build these teams with this increased level of diversity, we immediately run into this problem, right? Mm. Uh, most businesses in Australia have plenty of rhinos. We don't need more, mm. right? You got me. You got me thinking. Interestingly, around like a lot of the way the way that problem or issue is dealt with from a advice standpoint, a lot of the time is by having other people look at the advice on the back end. But yeah, are they but different? the problem is, well, yeah, are they different? That's one question. And um, the other question is like, what are they missing out on from? Because no one, you got me thinking about the front end and. How do you bring more people into like maybe maybe it would be a good idea to have two two types of mm. advisors in the same meeting for each client? It could be, yeah. I mean, the the challenge you've got um, is in a relatively short amount of time, your job is to understand what's driving the person you're meeting, right? Mm. That's what you're trying to do. What's going on with this person? And Un- underlying that are two big pressures. One is this person wants financial advice and they want to know where to put their money and they've got a bunch of needs there. They don't want to talk about, you know, which holidays they went on last year. They want to talk about this stuff. And so I feel this pressure that I need to meet that need and you've got the pressure of I can't be here too long because financial advice is expensive and I need to go and see other clients all these other things. Mm. So what frames your conversation too often is those two big elephants in the corner mm. of the room, right? What is important to them is what's, what does that person feel? What do they love? What do they dream about? What do they care about? Uh, and, you know, often I see we try and capture these through surveys and all this sort of stuff, and surveys and numbers are really uh, ineffective at capturing the story that sits behind the person. Mm. Um, I'll give you a, an analogy for this. So uh, we're, we're chatting before the interview. Um I'm a, a, a pretty fat cyclist now. I, I love cycling. I'm a, I'm a bit of a mammal, right? Get the liker on. Uh, and one of my dreams was to cycle up this mountain, Mont Ventoux, in mm-hmm. France. It's very famous. Tour de France always go up there. It's 20 kilometres from bottom to the top. It's brutally steep, like 9%, 10% gradient. And it took me about two hours, right, to bottom to top, which is pretty slow. Um, it's pretty it's still impressive. It's, One degrees gradient. It's, uh, it's hard work. It, but uh, I, I didn't do it alone. I had like a, a heart rate monitor. I had a cadence monitor. I had a Garmin, you know, tracker. You had the electric motor. Uh, no, no, electric okay. motor. No, that's cheating. <laughs> but I had all this, you know, I have an iPhone, with, and all this data capturing devices. Yeah. And, and you're up there, you're going, this is fucked. And it's saying, oh, yep, yep, you're at full peak of capacity. That's right. You're, you're, <laughs> your heart's about to explode. What would chest. you do without that? <laughs> <laughs> well, what's interesting is you do. I did all that for the main reason, and all other um, middle-aged men in Lycra will know this. You've got to get the data so you can put it on Strava, the website. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. So you can compete because if it's not there, it never happened. Yeah, right? yeah. Now, what's interesting is if I gave you all of that data and you looked through it, you would find nothing remarkable. Right? I wasn't particularly. If you mapped all of my data versus the hundreds of thousands of other people who've cycled up that mountain. I'd be nothing extraordinary. I'd be, you know, in the middle of the bell curve, pretty dull. And you would overlook it as if it was nothing particularly important. Mm. But for me, that was a really proud moment in my mm. cycling, you know, career, in, in inverted commas. It, it was really important. It, I was very proud that I was able to achieve something that I dreamed of achieving for a really long period of time. And nowhere in that data does that sense of pride sit Mm. But in my memory... Mainly you get detracts from it because you're like, oh, I'm only at this level in the Strava right. rankings. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I came like, you know, 30,000 out of 250,000. real special. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but this is the point, right? So mm. the data doesn't at all, doesn't not only just it not capture the story, but the story and its importance is all that matters to me. Mm. The data is actually irrelevant. Mm. Yet we work with clients in a whole bunch of different industries and sectors where we go, let's run big surveys. Mm. I, if I gave you a spreadsheet and I said, okay, fill out this spreadsheet to describe yourself, you wouldn't be able to do it. The numbers wouldn't ever... How long is the spreadsheet? <laughs> but the numbers wouldn't tell me about you, right? Mm. Yes, no answers. One to ten answers can't tell me about you. None of us would describe ourselves by numbers on the spreadsheet. Wouldn't give enough depth, you might say. It wouldn't wouldn't tell our story, right? Mm. Um, and the whole point is that 
the stories, what actually we matter, what we care, what we care about, it's what drives us, it's what ma- really matters to us, right? Mm. And often when we um, work on big spreadsheets and data and you know, mine things, we find the averages. Mm-hmm. Who wants to be average? No one. No one's desperately, like, oh, I hope I could just be sort of Just same. above average. <laughs> Everyone wants to be above average, right? <laughs> Um, and so the things that drive us are these uh, these senses of fairness and justice and love and passion, hope, fear. These things don't live on spreadsheets very well. Mm. They only exist in our heads and they, they've got their hands on the steering wheel making most of the decisions. Mm. Right? They drive the boat here. Mm-hmm. So we've got to really, I think, work out ways to tap into and understand what's going on in our clients' minds. What's the mm. story that's driving them? Mm-hmm. Once you understand that, you're in a much better position to be able to work with them, understand what's going to be best for them in the future, plan that future with them. Um, great advisors will probably do this naturally, mm. won't even think that they're doing it. Uh, other people will do it with some people and they'll struggle with others. Oh, I just didn't connect with that person. All of these things are probably cases where you're trying to understand those things that are going on in other people's heads. Mm. Your natural default will be, well, you know, we'll do things like, well, you would probably think the same way I would think, right? Mm. You'd want to make millions of dollars like I want to make millions of dollars. Mm. Or I've seen someone who is like you, looks like you, seems similar. They wanted ABC. What am I going to think you're going to want? Mm. ABC, right? Yeah. This is the natural assumptions we'll always make. Well, a lot of people say like the natural gravitation of advisors is just for people that are similar to them. Like that's that's well, how. And you'll probably be best placed for them because mm. they'll trust you. And you'll you know if you think about these those mental models in your head, we'll synchronize those really quickly and mm. easily. There's less there's less resistance to overcome. That's right. Mm. The challenge is going back to the diversity model. What's going to get us the most interesting outcomes in the future mm. will be people who don't think like us. Mm. When I can collaborate with someone who thinks differently to me, mm. then we've got a chance. Only if we can both understand each other's drivers and motivations, mm. then we're in an awesome place, right? Because you hear this. I met a guy this morning who told me he went into um, an IT business. He'd never done IT. And he'd gone into this IT business. that hired him in. He just needed the work. He said, sure, I'll come and do it. Um, and after about 12 months uh, of working there, they said, okay, a couple of things. One, you're not very good at IT. <laughs> he said, yeah, I know. Like, they said, but you came up with ideas that we never thought of. You mm. opened doors that we could never get to. Mm. You designed things that we never could have dreamt of mm. because he saw the world through a different frame. Mm. And in that space, he did an amazing – he created amazing outcomes for mm. them. So when we're hiring people, are we hiring people based on what we think we need and mm. looking for a certain set of attributes, or are we hiring people who are really different mm. but can share these certain beliefs and understandings? Well, who's going to compliment? Who's, like, absolutely. Who's going to be the people who are going to pick up or see the world in a different shade of green to me, mm. and that's going to allow us to see things that we, we either one of us mm. on our own would never have been able to do. Well, it's interesting, Yeah. It's sort of, I've always looked at advice from a whole brain aspect that a full advice practice needs to cover the full spectrum of, um, I guess, the type of brain and type of thinking yeah. to execute on, and, and style of, of behaviour to execute on what needs to be done in the advice practice. Yep. But I suppose the only thing that doesn't reflect on is that if, if you've got that and you've still got a, a practice like a head of the practice or a principal that's still making the shots over the top of everything, you're not getting the diversity at that level. Yeah. So you still that's still casting this, um, I guess this, I don't know, maybe not, shadow's not the right word, but, uh, it, <laughs> but might this. Be, it might be the right <laughs> word. Look, the, the, what were you describing there is the, the, the sort of leadership style mm. that sits over this. And, um, you know, I'm conscious that the majority of people who will listen to this will go, well, I'm not a leader. And but I wish my leader would do these things, and then he'd be a better leader, or she would be a better leader. Um, I'd challenge that everyone in their own right is a leader in some way, because mm. you're always going to be influencing, working with other people. Now, whether um, it's from the top or the bottom, top or the of bottom, that. whether it's with your family and friend, mm. you know, you, there's always these situations where we've got to step up and, and be a leader in a certain mm. situation, and we're really good at saying, "Well, if I was the leader, I would do these things." Mm. Often without understanding what those pressures are and what's going on. Um, so 
what are, the, the thing I work on with leaders, and there's a couple of different exercises we do, um, but the way I sort of think about it is think of a, a sort of X, Y axis. So on the vertical axis, we've got questions at the top and answers at the bottom. Mm-hmm. And on the horizontal axis, we've got irrelevant on the left and relevant on the right. So you mm-hmm. can either have relevant or irrelevant questions or answers. Mm-hmm. And so what we know is that people who ask lots of irrelevant questions are like annoying little kids, right? four-year-olds. Why, 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 why? And no one wants to be that person, right? Mm. So we sort of think that's a bad space. Questions and irrelevant questions are bad. What we actually do is for leaders in particular, and this is honed into us from kids. Right? When we're a little kid, teachers are smart and they know all the answers. Mm-hmm. You go to school, the kids who know all the answers are smart, right? Mm. Smart as kids. You go to uni, the same thing, lecturer knows all the answers, TAFE, you know, uh, when you go to work, who's got all the answers? The mm-hmm. boss, right? person in the corner office, they've got all the answers. So we have this default mode that says the place to be on this graph is the bottom right. Have all the relevant answers. That's mm. where the experts sit. Mm. And as an advisor, people often say, well, you're the expert. <clears throat> you know all the answers. Cool. Challenge with that is whether your answers are relevant or irrelevant is not up to you. Mm. It's up to the person hearing them, right? Mm. So, in this case, the client. Yeah. In this case, the client, or maybe it's your employees if you're the the lead, right? So, you're if you fall into that category of you're giving lots of irrelevant answers, these are just seen as arrogant opinions. Mm. You know, this this bucket down here, the bottom uh, left mm. side, where we have lots of irrelevant answers is not a place you want to be. And we've all been in that situation, mm. right, where someone's just telling you, telling you, telling you, like this is not what I wanted to hear. Uh, this is not the right. You're missing the point here. Mm. The The problem with saying I'm going to start out trying to be an expert, trying to have all the relevant answers, is you don't control whether you flip over to being just full of arrogant opinions. Mm. That's not up to you. Relevance and irrelevance is up to the, the eyes of the person who's receiving them. Mm-hmm. So the thing I really coach and, and we do in workshops and through talks is how do we help people step up to relevant curious questions mm-hmm. so curious leadership is sitting in this top right hand corner I'm, I'm starting with questions questions are my focus and I'm trying to make sure that they're relevant questions because mm-hmm. if you start in that place you have a much much better eye, uh, chance of keeping in the relevant space right because mm-hmm. you can clarify oh that's interesting tell me more about that and you can you can search and if you need to give the answers mm-hmm. you're far better place to stay relevant right It's much easier to stay on that side when you're asking lots of questions first. So I would say as a leader, if you're casting this shadow and and you want to change that or you think it's influencing the way you're doing things, I would be inclined to say, how do we tap into you as being a curious leader? So when you, rather than being the person with all the answers who sets the tone and this is how we're doing things, Mm. flip that and be the person that when someone walks into your office, you go, how you doing? Well, how can I help you today? What's going on? Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. Mm. Well, what do you think we should do in that space? Dig into it, right? Mm. D- just stay in the curious space. The um, Some of the best leaders I've ever worked with, uh, Peter Harmer at IAG is probably one of the best leaders I've worked with. I'd walk into his office and he'd go, hi, Daniel, how are you today? What can I help you with? That would be his opening question every single time. Mm. What he, do you want? What do you want to get out of this? You know, Okay, well, what do you think about that? Oh, that sounds really interesting. What else is going on in that space? You know, or what? You know, oh, such and such did. This. Oh, what did they think about it? And he was constantly pushing the responsibility for answers back to me because mm. he wanted to understand and stay relevant. Now, if there came a point where he had to make a decision, it was he was much better place to do it. Mm. So, as a, as a leader, giving yourself that space, mm. taking the responsibility off of I need to have all the answers mm. to. That's why I hire you guys, right? You guys are going to have the answers. Mm. From an advisor's perspective, you know, it, it's the answers need to come from the client. Mm. Right? So your job is to be really, really curious so that you make sure that when you do have to provide the advice, it's got to be off the chart relevant, right? Mm. Um, any advisor um, who's given a piece of advice and the client's gone, like, what? <laughs> what's that? Mm. Almost certainly you fall into the trap of, well, I know what's best. Here's the here's the right answer, but I didn't actually understand what's going on with that person, and therefore I've totally missed mm. that relevance part. Missed the mark. So that, that's a really key point as well for leaders. How do the leaders create an environment where 
the expertise sits with their people mm. and the tone is set by their people and they lead through curious leadership. So interesting. <laughs> I hope everyone's um, – it's intriguing listening to, I guess, these concepts talked about. So um, – it's I guess, hard to draw, draw diagrams in the air too, I think. It's yeah, it is. <laughs> yes. Maybe we'll, we'll get a sketch for next time. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always do diagrams. Well, Daniel, it's it's been awesome to unpack these things and, and talk through them. And I hope everyone's been getting some insights out of it. And I, it, there's some great parallels we've had with uh, with advice and how it's Absolutely. relevant to the client relationship and I think just people's lives in general. Yeah. Um, what If people want to find out more about what you do and – um, and I guess or if they want to get involved in this space or... Sure. Yeah. What? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways. Um, Empathic Consulting is, is my business name. Um, and uh, the focus of Empathic Consulting is how do we create leaders who are curious, uh, businesses who, who connect with people and understand people more. And so empathy is sort of the underlying thing we're really trying to build. How do we build empathy as a capability for business? Um, the ways we do that, so I work with quite a few organisations on how do we structure the way they engage in the community mm -hmm. and build a strategy around that so that it actually adds value to their business. Mm -hmm. um, I think too many businesses just do things because they think they should or trying to be nice and actually miss a lot of opportunities there. Second thing I do is I run uh, workshops for uh, groups, usually mm -hmm. small groups, eight to ten, uh, sometimes a little bit larger. And these workshops are around taking some of the ideas, some of those concepts, and really starting to embed them in practice. Um, we do some pretty cool innovative stuff where we take uh, groups to uh, charities and different environments. The objective is uh, not just to give back to the community. There's a part of it that's there. But the, the real objective is how do I take you into a zone or a space or to meet people where your mental models don't work anymore? Mm. Right, because that's what we're battling against. Yep. We're battling against these frames of reference. So often we go into a boardroom, we run a workshop, no one cares. Like everyone walks out, going, "Oh, it's boring," because it's really hard to challenge your mental models when you're stuck in an environment that reinforces. Mm -hmm. So we, we run these workshops; they're really effective. We did some work with MacBank in, in in this space, and it really blew them away. The last way we do this uh, that I, the, I, I work is um, by speaking, keynote speaking, mm -hmm. presentations, um, professional speaker. So come to conferences, uh, leadership events, and, and just start to go through some of these exercises, much like we've done today, but really diving into how do we do this live amongst the audience. Interactive right audience. Now. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, definitely. Getting Alan and Bob to have their stories and diving yeah, yeah. each other in, etc. The, the number one focus there, again, is how do we make things practical, easy, and relevant mm. so you can take them away and use them. Yeah, there'd be a lot of stuff you could do in the interactive space. It's with what pretty we've been fun. Yeah. You know, we, we, I use uh, some, I guess you call them illusions in some way, to, to highlight the way your brain works. But the, the number one thing for me is how do we take this amazing world of neuroscience, psychology, behavioural economics, and create it in simple enough frameworks that businesses can pick it up and use it straight away? Um, it, it's it's almost unreachable at some times. Mm. It, it sounds too complicated. It sounds fluffy. Well, that doesn't work, right? We need to make it really simple and robust. My background in strategy means that I try and make these things really simple, fit on a page, simple diagrams you can write down to remember, but they're, they're tangible and usable and, and gives you the opportunity to straight away. is powerful. Absolutely. You, you, know, you see the guys in the audience that write it down on a notebook and that, that you know little sketch on the notebook becomes instantly usable in the cab ride home. Mm. That's where we want to get to. So, um, yeah, I do professional speaking is a really uh, fun part of what I do. And uh, you can get in touch with me through my website or LinkedIn is always a good one. I put a lot of content up there as well. Awesome. Cool. Dale, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks for coming so on. Thanks, Adrian. <laughs>